Hi guys, today we are talking about The Fury by John Ferris, and I have meant to read this book for as long as I have been watching the movie, and I just never found it. And I was, I think, looking for the Blu-ray version of The Fury, and this popped up as a suggestion. And it is so different, but there's a lot of similarities. So it's almost like I don't know, when I was reading this, I half expected things to follow a certain course, but I knew that the method that it was going to take to get there would be different, if that makes sense. So let me start out by saying that it's, I love the movie and I liked the book. I liked the book a lot. Gillian Belliver is the main character in The Fury. Gillian was played by Amy Irving and I always assumed that she was 16, 17 years old. She's 14 in the book. And Robin is actually the same age. We find out in the course of this book that Gillian was a twin and her brother died in the womb. So it, like he had an umbilical cord wrapped around his throat or something and he died and at the last minute See, I didn't exactly know this because she and Robin are like psychic twins and they've been visiting each other through like an astral projection type of thing ever since they were little. So he wanted to be born as her brother, but her brother was in distress while he was being born and that caused Robin to have to find a different body. So I, it's kind of like a reincarnation thing. like. He tried to be in that body, but the body was about to die, so he had to move on and find a different place. So anyway, he and Gillian are twins in a way, and that isn't really gone into in the movie. Peter Sansa is pretty much how I expected him to be in this book, but there is a plot twist that really shocked me and Kind of ha kind of kept me guessing also. Let's see, they're both 14, they're young, um, pretty much follows the movie. Gillian is from a rich family. You don't see her dad in the movie, but you see him in the book quite a bit. And he has some experience with kind of mystical things, um, supernatural type things. He is open to that. Gillian's mom is not that way and she gets very concerned about Gillian and eventually she has to go away because being in Gillian's presence has caused her to start hemorrhaging blood which she has interpreted as even though she went through menopause a couple years ago she is getting her period again even though it's copious amounts of blood that she's losing and she actually does have to get out of Gillian's presence because the amount of blood she's losing is quite scary. In the movie, it takes place in Chicago during like spring or summer because we have Gillian and LaRue walking on the beach and they're in bathing suits. In the book, it's New York and Gillian is walking with LaRue by an ice skating rink and it's almost Christmas time. They've done Christmas shopping. Gillian has a, a vision of Raymond Dunwoody with a bullet hole in his head and that ends up coming true but it causes her to faint and LaRue packs her off to a hospital. She sends her in an ambulance. Gillian spends a lot of time in the hospital. She is like having this psychic awakening. There is another patient in the hospital with her and she has had some sort of like varicose vein surgery or some sort of leg surgery. I don't remember exactly what kind and when Gillian goes to see her, the woman grabs Gillian, causes all of her surgical wounds to reopen and she bleeds out and Gillian is slipping around in the blood. It's very descriptive and there's a whole, there's a whole like, she runs into Peter at the hospital. He tells her that he'll come back for her. Gillian kills another woman in the elevator. The woman has high blood pressure and she's a really tall, large woman. 
and Gillian holds her hand or touches her and she just causes this woman to explode in blood because the woman already had high blood pressure and that just sets her off. So Gillian goes into this weird, weird state at back at home and she's kind of surly and her parents can't really reach her and she is practicing her astral projections. She's leaving her body. Her dad knows what's happening. He can, he's like, oh, she is experiencing this. We have to not wake her up. Her mom's freaked out. They end up calling the um, Paragon Institute doctor. He's in this. Hester works there like she does in the movie. Um, Hester breaks her out in pretty much the same way that it happens in the movie. Jesus Christ. Hester gets away and back to her apartment. She sends Gillian off to a movie and Peter comes to the apartment and she opens the door to her neighbors who she's recently met and they shoot her because they are undercover agents and they've been spying on her. So she does die, not in the same way, and it's pretty, um, pretty graphic. Peter's a complete badass. Earlier in the book, he has that same thing where he drives a car off of the pier and he kind of fakes his own death in a way. And he reemerges and he's trying to get help and he goes to some of his old friends who are enemies of Childermass. Yes, Childermass. That's John Cassavetes' character. In the movie, he's Childress. In the book, he's Childermass. So anyway, Peter goes for help to these, to these friends of his and enemies of Childermass. They end up hypnotizing him, programming him to kill Robin. And he is unaware of this. And he he's given a word. He and Robin have nicknames for each other. He calls Robin Skipper and Robin calls him Commander. And when when Robin utters the word Commander, that's going to set Peter off and he is going to kill Robin without even realizing what he's doing. So it's the same premise. The government has this government agency called the Morgue in the book has Robin. They are studying him. They faked his death and took him to a different, more secluded um, observation area. And they've told him that his father is dead. They've convinced him to, you know, use his powers. They're making him angry and agitated. And he actually starts a relationship with his doctor, kind of like in the movie, but at least in the movie, they seem more age appropriate. In this, the woman is 29 and he is 14. And that's just is a little weird. So they have a relationship and her name is Gwen and she is manipulating him, studying him. He ends up killing her in a slightly different way. He bleeds her out. It's not as glorious as it is in the movie where he rise, raises her up in the air and he spins her around and she just splatters blood over everything. Um, so They've convinced him that his father is dead and they're counting on the fact that once they see each other again, they're going to call each other their little nicknames and that is going to take care of Robin because these people who have hypnotized Peter don't want Robin around because he's dangerous and especially in the hands of Childermass, he could be a potential just world ending problem for everyone involved. So. This whole time, I'm like, is Peter, does Peter, because Peter is such a badass. It's like, does he know and he is pretending to be hypnotized or is he really hypnotized? So that was something that kept me guessing throughout the whole thing. The final showdown is pretty much like in the book where um, Peter and Robin are dangling off of a roof. And it's just even more heartbreaking in the book because it's not super clear in the movie. I think I mentioned that in my review of it, that it's kind of like, I feel like Peter just gave up on Robin. Like Robin reaches up and claws his face and just seems to have no ability to come back from that. So Peter gives up and he just lets him go and then he kills himself. But in this, Robin has this moment of like almost remorse and hope and you think he might actually be saved and then 
he and Peter utter their little nicknames. As soon as Robin says commander, Peter drops him and he dies. And it's just horrible. And Peter doesn't even realize that he's the one who killed him. Childermas freaks out and he shoots Peter. So they both die like in the movie. And Gillian is kind of coached by another doctor in this book who isn't in the movie. And she's told that, you know, you have this great power and Childermas is going to use it and he's going to exploit you and you're never going to escape from this unless you kill him. And the doctor is trying to save her own ass too, as well as, um, as well as Gillian's. And she goes to Childermas's suite and she drowns him. So she drowns him and bleeds him out that way, which is different from the movie in which he like, explodes. But all in all, it's a really good book, really interesting. The movie follows the book quite faithfully in some parts, but there are a lot of things that I was like, huh. And I think the movie is better than the book. I don't always say that, but I do feel like, and it's not because I've seen the movie a million times and I love it, but I do think that some of the writing style is not the best and there were some really lengthy descriptions of psychic psychic stuff that I just didn't care about and I thought something that was really cool is there's so many authors that I enjoy and respect who commented on this there's a quote on the very front of the book quote America's premier novelist of horror nobody does it better and that's from Stephen King and then on the back Peter Benchley who I also love Quote, Ferris has a genius for creating compelling suspense. And that's from Peter Benchley. So I know there are sequels to this. I don't know that I really care to delve into them. You know, I'm invested in Peter and Hester who are dead now. Robin, I just, I feel bad for him, but I also don't care. And he's dead anyway. And then Gillian is fine, but... I like her more in the movie than in this. Oh, another huge thing. She kills LaRue in the book. That was the biggest, um, just shocking twist. LaRue even mentions that she had been prone to nosebleeds and there's like a false sense of security because she hugs Gillian and nothing happens. And then Gillian is trying to help LaRue out by connecting her with her dead brother, who LaRue just worshipped and adored and some at some point during this connection Gillian must have caused LaRue to just start bleeding profusely from her nose and when Gillian wakes up from her trance she sees blood everywhere and she follows the trail and LaRue is behind the bathroom door dead just bled out and Gillian seems to have more power over people than just by it's almost as though, because touching does seem to cause things to happen like it does in the movie whenever she touches someone and they start bleeding. Um, in this instance, she can touch you, but then she still has like a like, electromagnetic force field or something around her and it continues to affect you. So Peter, when he and she are going to, the, to go see Robin, they are sharing a room and he had hugged her and they had slept together in the same bed and when he wakes up he can't feel someone's fingers so he thinks that she has kind of caused him to have a stroke of some kind and then it progressively gets worse so even though he's not constantly touching her he's in her presence and it seems to once it's started it seems to continue i really do wish they had left the peter brainwashing thing in there also in the movie, I get the sense that Gillian and Robin hadn't known each other ever before. And in the book, I was very shocked to know that they were basically sharing a space before they were born. And then, um, you know, they were frequently visiting each other as kids. And I guess um, Gillian's parents thought that Robin was an imaginary friend. And Gillian called him Skipper. So there's that little thing with 
Peter and and um, Robin. Little little link there. Yeah, I think that's about it. I really recommend it. If you have read the sequels, let me know. Have a spooky day.